Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. This is a call and response. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Okay, bienvenidos. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, we're immensely pleased to have President Solis of Costa Rica with us. Bienvenido, señor presidente. Uh, good, un gusto tenerlo aquí con nosotros en el Woodrow Wilson Center. It's a great pleasure to have you with us here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Andrew Seeley. I'm Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center here on behalf of Jane Harmon, our President and CEO, who is out of the country, but personally had the chance to invite uh, President Solis to join us and was very sorry to, to miss this. And on behalf of Cindy Arnson, the Director of the Latin American Program, as you all know, we have a very strong commitment to Latin America here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It is, uh, I think, the second oldest program at the Wilson Center, but in many guises we pay enormous attention to the region. We believe the Americas are incredibly important for the future of the United States. And it is worth saying that today um, we are very fortunate also to be working with the American Dialogue. Um, thank you very much, Manuel Orozco, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, who is uh, here on behalf of the American Dialogue, Senior Fellow and Director of the Migration, Remittances, and Development uh, Project. And Kevin Casas Zamora is here as well, I believe, from the Dialogue, I saw a minute ago. Uh, Kevin, wherever you are, great to have you here. There he is waving. Um, Eric Olson, the Deputy Director of the Latin American Program, is here as well, as well as several colleagues from the Latin American Program. And so welcome to all of you. Um, the complex handling of migration has already emerged as one of the defining issues of the early 21st century. Um, virtually every program at the Wilson Center, regional and thematic, is wrestling with this issue and how to confront it. And it's become a major focus of our Latin American program, particularly with respect to undocumented migrants, especially young people from the Northern Triangle of Central America. Um, and the Inter-American Dialogue has also done a great deal of work on this, uh, particularly Manuel's work, but a number of other colleagues there as well. Um, I uh, want to recognize a few distinguished members of President Solis' delegation who are with us today. Uh, Manuel Gonzalez, the Minister of Foreign Relations. There he is. Uh, Sergio Alfaro, Minister of the Presidency. Um, Costa Rican Ambassador of the United States, Roman Macaya. Roman, good to have you here again. And also pleased to welcome back to the center uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Costa Rica, Ann Andrew. She is with us as well. And Susan Molinari, former member of Congress, is with us as well in the back. Good to have you here, Susan. Um, delighted you could all join us and everyone else, and I apologize if I'm leaving anyone else out here, but this is a wonderful audience. Um, today's event is particularly timely and relevant. Migration issues have never been absent from Costa Rica's policy debates, but in recent months the situation has become particularly acute. Large groups of migrants from Cuba, fearing a more restrictive policy towards Cuban migration on the part of the United States, have flooded across the border between Panama and Costa Rica, trying to reach the United States. To Costa Rica's north, Nicaragua has closed its border to migrants, trapping large numbers of migrants from numerous countries and regions in Costa Rica. To discuss this burgeoning crisis and other issues, it is my great pleasure to introduce President Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera. He is the 47th President of the Republic of Costa Rica and was elected in 2014 on the ticket of the Citizen Action Party. In the perfect Wilsonian tradition, he is both a scholar and a diplomat. He has been a professor of history and political science at the University of Costa Rica and vice dean of the School of Social Sciences. And he's also been long affiliated with FLAXO, the Latin American Social Science Faculty, very well respected organization. And he's held positions at the University of Michigan and Florida International University. As chief of staff in the Costa Rican Minis Foreign Ministry, he helped negotiate the Central American Peace Plan named for former Costa Rican president and Nobel Peace Prize winner Oscar Arias. Solis subsequently became ambassador for Central American Affairs and director of foreign policy in the foreign ministry. He is the author of 10 books and innumerable articles in journals and newspapers. And if none of that has kept him busy, he is also the proud father of six children. Probably his most important works, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> Mr. President, please join me at the podium to present your remarks. And uh, please uh, go ahead and join me in welcoming him now. President Solis, bienvenido. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I've been kept busy. Six children, a lot of children. I'm sometimes asked uh, if I'm Mormon or if I'm a, a, a Christian Democrat uh, uh, or a fanatical Catholic, and I have to say no, that I'm just a, a very fortunate man of having so many, so many children. I, I want to thank uh, the Wilson Center and the um, Inter-American Dialogue for holding this wonderful, wonderful occasion to meet you all, and I want you to thank you for coming, uh, especially on a Monday uh, summer. It's it's great to have you, and I hope that my remarks will will be of interest to you all. Um, I want to begin by saying how pleased I am after ha holding a very successful meeting with President Obama 
and Vice President Biden at the White House. We've been talking about uh, security issues in Central America. We've talked about migrations, energy questions, and uh, I think uh, the long-standing friendship and cooperation between the United States and Costa Rica have been strengthened quite a bit. In fact, the White House has just announced uh, a significant assistance uh, program to combat organized crime, which obviously um, includes uh, not only narco-trafficking in and on itself, a big uh, challenge for all the countries in the Caribbean region, but also migrations. And this is, you know, the what I would like to to talk about to to this afternoon. And after that, we can we can have questions and from you, and I may address other issues as well. Um, yes, last uh, October, we started to see a flow of Cuban migrants coming into Costa Rica. We received in just between October and March around 8,000 of them, mm, all of whom were uh, transferred to uh, the United States ultimately after numerous uh, diplomatic uh, re uh, negotiations with Central American countries and with Mexico, uh, all of which I, I, I am very grateful about. As you know, the, the Cuban migration has a logic in and on itself. Uh, it is uh, privileged by the United States, by a series of, of laws and also administrative measures. And until those measures are somehow changed, it will continue to be a very uh, attractive uh, circumstance for Cubans to leave the island. It was also favored by the fact that uh, Ecuador had uh, issued a universal citizens uh, policy, and that uh, explains why a big number of them were able to reach Ecuador without the need of visas, uh, several thousands throughout the years. Uh, many more than the 8,000 we received had already traveled through Central America by October of last year. Some people uh, talk of tens of thousands prior to our realizing that this was happening, mainly after destroying a traffickers network that was run by Costa Ricans last year, at the end of last year. When this happened, all of a sudden, 1,500 Cubans appeared. And so that led to the, our authorities to begin studying the situation, and then the flow became obvious. We, we provided faces and names to something that had happened uh, for a number of years, and this uh, called the attention of everybody into the phenomenon. Now, uh, migrations obviously occur everywhere, but we had not had that experience in Costa Rica ever. During the 1980s, we had refugees, which is a different category, as most of you know, um, of migrants. We had had refugees coming to Costa Rica, running away from war in the Northern Triangle and Nicaragua particularly. But uh, this is a completely different phenomenon. These are individuals that are coming from the South into uh, looking, seeking for uh, somehow to get to the United States. And uh, so it resembles more the phenomenon that you're seeing elsewhere in, in Europe and, and Asia. At the beginning uh, of, of this flow, which you, we had mainly Cubans, but um, around February, March, we started to uh, identify what we thought were, and so were they called, extracontinental migrants reaching Costa Rica. At the time, we thought that most of them were African or Asian, and true enough, we've had people from Senegal, Congo, um, uh, Tibet, uh, mm, where else, uh, Pakistan, uh, a number of them coming from, from Western Africa into, into Costa Rica. But, um, very soon, when we started providing them with services that were supposed to be aimed at Muslims and Africans, we realized that even when all of them um, claimed to, to be called uh, Muhammad Ali, because all of them had the same name, we realized that the French they spoke was not Western African French. It was Creole. And then we realized they were all, most of them were coming from Haiti. So now we, we, we now know that around 80 to 85 percent of the migrants are Haitians that are coming towards the north from Brazil. And upon researching a little bit how, what the flow, uh, how the flow could be explained, we realized that th these were Haitians who, were being, who had been invited by Brazil to become special residents in the country after the earthquake in 2000. 
uh, 11, I think, uh, as many as 50,000, we are told, who were able to find uh, jobs in Brazil, because at the time Brazil was preparing for the, world, the, the soccer world championship, and uh, after that, the Olympics. So there was plenty of work. They had friendly governments in Brazil, first uh, Lula and then Dilma, and the economy of Brazil was thriving. Uh, that changed. And as it changed, they started moving north. And now we have this huge amount of Haitians that uh, have traveled uh, to the, or are traveling to the north. We still have the extracontinentals uh, mixed with them. Uh, they cannot come to the United States. The United States government has issued very clear um, indications that they're not going to be received, if at all possible. And obviously, we have a problem again because the Nicaraguan government closed its border with Costa Rica, so they cannot easily uh, travel to the north. They are doing it, nevertheless, <laughs> because unfortunately, as it happens with most of this flow, a good part of them are being uh, taken north by coyotes, by traffickers. What we've tried to do in Costa Rica is to provide, them, provi provide to them safe passage in our territory. So they're given up to 25 days to be in Costa Rica without any uh, physical limitations. So they, don't, so they don't have to fear our authorities. So they can, you know, they don't need coyotes to go through Costa Rica up looking, moving north. But uh, that's not the case elsewhere. And, and clearly it's not the case once they reach the borders where they are, you know, uh, they, they are um, prey of these uh, networks, unfortunately. Now, the situation is complicated because uh, deportation is a very complicated issue to, uh, it's very difficult to achieve. Not only because they are to be guaranteed, and I think that we're, we must be very proud of this, they have to be guaranteed due process of any deportation uh, policy, and, and this means that each case has to be uh, individually handled by the migration authorities, but also in the case of Cubans, they could resort to uh, legal conditions within the country, like habeas corpus, for example, that led to a number of petitions uh, to the Supreme Court, to the Constitutional Chamber or Supreme Court, that ruled that Cubans could not be <coughs> deported to Cuba because their lives could be threatened. So we cannot deport Cubans, and then we could deport Haitians. In fact, we've deported one already because it's very difficult to do so. We have to f know who they are to begin with. There's probably that person is not called Muhammad Ali. Secondly, we have to find where he comes from. Thirdly, the country uh, of origin, in this case Haiti, has to admit that person back, which is something that's not happening. Uh, the Haitian government's becoming more receptive, but still is a... Uh, governments resist getting these individuals back. And fourthly, they don't want to go back to their countries, which makes it very difficult for organizations such as the uh, International Organization of Migrations to be able to fully operate with the programs because they're basically seeking to, repatri to repatri them, repatriate them voluntarily, which obviously is not occurring. So, you know, the, the uh, overall picture has become pretty uh, difficult to, to, to administer because we didn't have the experience. We didn't have the resources. I was just sharing with some of, of you just a few minutes ago that, for example, the health services that we are providing in Costa Rica are the same services everybody else has received in, in the country. We have a social security, universal social security, so we are giving them uh, that same treatment. But this is not... It's, it, we don't have the, the, the mandate to do this, nor the money to, to pay for it. So it's, it's done on a humanitarian basis, but it has a cost in the medical services that needs to be taken care of somewhere and by some, someone, which is going to be the central government, of course, and we are under very serious financial stress at this time. In fact, uh, we are negotiating a fiscal, a fiscal a, 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 a tax, a new tax law with with Congress, and as it is the case with every Congress, it has been very difficult to achieve that. So uh, that's one, one, uh, one issue. And the other issue which troubles us er very much, and some of you who are uh, human rights activists uh, would probably uh, know better about this, is the fact that many of these uh, migrants are accompanied by children. And we don't know if these children are theirs. 
So some authorities are requesting DNA samples, for example, to, 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 to prove that uh, these individuals are the parents of the children they carry. And this is going to you know, bring about a big discussion of where these analyses are going to take place, how long are they going to take in order to do this, and if, it is, if the, the hypothesis is true that these children are also part of uh, human smuggling, uh, those who are traveling with them will want to take them away very, very fast. And according to our law, particularly, uh, we cannot put children in jail. So we, there's no way we can hold them if their parents don't want to, to be with them. So, we, so you know, th these are the complexities, the practical complexities of, of this new situation. And to end this part and allow for a dialogue with you all, I don't want to take too more time, um, the networking of I irregular migrations, I, I don't like to say illegal migrations, they have all the legality to leave, migrants have that right. But the informality of these networks and the networks themselves resembles very much the narco-trafficking networking. And probably the networks are related. Human, narco, weapons, they all operate under the same logic. And so it is our duty to somehow uh, operate against this logic. And we are committed to doing this. I mean, it has to be seen on a hum as a humanitarian challenge. This is how we like to think we're handling it, as a humanitarian challenge. On the other hand, there are practical problems, national politics amongst, amongst them, that need to be addressed clearly and, and openly. We, we are in the process of letting the Costa Rican uh, population understand a phenomenon they never experienced before. And it's not easy. I mean, we're challenged by the socioeconomic conditions of our populations in the borders and in the coastal areas of the country, the poorest of the poor. And, and they question us. Why are you giving foreigners support that you are not providing us? And I think it's a very human <coughs> thing to, to ask. It's very natural that they ask these things. So it is, we are all learning in this, in this process. And uh, believe me, if you have any ideas, if you can give us guidance, those of you who have had experience with this, I, I, we would very much appreciate you letting us know of ways in which we can handle this. It's not easy, but nothing in life is easy. It's another challenge that I hope we will be able to respond with dignity for the migrants and with intelligence for our national politics. I do thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President Solis. Thanks, Manuel, and, and our colleagues at the Dialogue. I want to recognize a couple of additional people who are really critical to this event. Uh, Vero Colon of the Latin American Program, Ben Radensdorf of the Inter-American Dialogue. We're truly grateful uh, to you and to all of the people from around the center and around the Dialogue who are lending a hand today. Um, Ambassador Sol uh, excuse me, President Solis, I was wondering if I could open with a question that follows up more broadly on some of the points that you raised. Costa Rica is obviously in Central America, which is a very complicated region, where the immense majority of, of attention has been focused on the Northern Triangle, on the security crisis, and on the crisis, especially of unaccompanied minors coming from the Northern Triangle. Costa Rica and Nicaragua have been fortunate in that the levels of violence and insecurity have been way below, far below, um, anything seen in the Northern Triangle. Could you discuss a little bit more how Costa Rica is being impacted by the difficulties in the neighborhood and whether you feel the international community, not just the United States but your other Central American neighbors, um, are responding to the changing scenario in Costa Rica as a result of what's taking place in the region? Sure. Well, well I think that violence con continues to be a big challenge for for Central America in general, including Costa Rica, but clearly uh, the situation is much worse in the Northern Triangle. We have been getting um, hundreds, I would say thousands, of, uh, of um, refuge-seeking Central Americans in the past few years. Just from El Salvador, uh, 1,500 of them in two years, which is a lot of people. And, uh, these are people who are coming to Costa Rica and staying in Costa Rica. It's a different phenomenon completely different from the migration that I've just described. And, uh, and they have their rights to, and 
we understand the situation. But this is also happening with people from Honduras and also a few, and fewer but also significant numbers from Guatemala. What we've done in order to handle this, which has been happening for you know, a number of years now, is we've agreed with the United States a very interesting program, which was just uh, announced a couple of m a month ago, which will start as soon as, as early as September, um, which bring, will bring into Costa Rica people from the Northern Triangle who are being persecuted for different reasons, either members of the sexually diverse community or environmental leaders or uh, judges, you know, whatever, um, business people. They will come to Costa Rica in numbers not exceeding 200 persons at a time. Uh, they will be uh, pre-selected uh, in their countries of origin before coming to Costa Rica, but by uh, ACNUR, by the High Commissioner on Refugees, and by the U.S. <laughs> government. They will come to Costa Rica and they will stay up to six months, and then they will be taken to their final destination, mostly in the United States, but maybe in other countries if they're not suitable for refuge in, in the United States, Canada, the Nordic countries, some countries in South America. Um, and in this way, we could handle orderly what's already happening, and it's going to be under a UN mandate uh, as a, as a, as a pro program of the High Commissioner. We think that in this fashion, we can show our solidarity with our brothers and sisters of the Northern Triangle, <laughs> and <coughs> at the same time, to be consistent with uh, the Costa Rican uh, policy of um, human rights, respect, and other things that we've done in the past. Um, but this is uh, clearly something that will continue to happen in Central America as long as we have that violence uh, going. Mm -hmm. And in terms of insecurity, organized crime, delinquency um, within Costa Rica? Well, s so far the, the numbers have risen, unfortunately, but this has happened as a result of the increase in narco activity coming from Colombia. Mm. But for a number of years now, the traffickers are not going through Costa Rica, they're going through Costa Rica, but also are leaving their stuff behind. Mm. And this has generated a very complicated thing to handle, which is not a menudeo. You know, they're, mm. they're doing, um, how, how do you call it, uh, small... Uh, street sales, basically. Yeah, street sales. Yeah. The, you know, people are, they, they, they get, they're given very small quantities of drugs, but, but to a vast network. Of, of, of sellers, of salespersons. And this is uh, very, uh, it, it's been very detrimental to our, uh, to our security because what happens is you have the local cartels killing each other. So the numbers have risen uh, from last year and we, I think we're going to lose this year as well. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not optimistic about the numbers because of the infighting amongst these cartels. So one thing that I would like to ensure is that we continue, and this is why we're getting this uh, enhanced support from the United States, to prevent these kinds of maladies to be extended uh, more than what we can handle. And we have all the operatives, uh, the security operatives, working very hard in order to, uh, to uh, limit the actions of these narcotraficantes, but it's, um, it's been very difficult. Uh, now, they, they are not coming from from the other countries. I want to be clear about that. These are Costa Ricans, mostly. Huh? I, uh, and, uh, and people who live in Costa Rica, so I, I don't want to portray <laughs> Costa Ricans <laughs> as being little angels, but, but it's, it's, a, it's clearly something that we're getting because of, of, of this enhanced uh, traffic in the region, which we have been combating very effectively. Costa Rican authorities, even without an army and with very little support, have been more efficient combating narco-trafficking than uh, the authorities of all the other countries, including Mexico, which is something that I would like to yeah. stress because uh, it's been a significant effort we've, we've made so far. Okay. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, Costa Rica has one of the largest interdictions, cocaine interdictions for decades. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on, on Cindy. And Cindy, thank you very much for co-sponsoring and co-partnering. Um, you know, my first question is, you know, where do you see Costa Rica in five or ten years from now, uh, with the Northern Triangle, if we call it like that, um, there is already, this is perhaps the second largest global migration crisis with at least half a million Central Americans trying to come or live in Central America. But now you see a new pattern taking place. Uh, one is uh, of an increased number of extracontinentals, um, you know, in, 
in 2010, for example, Mexico was intercepting about less than a thousand Africans coming from that part of the world, and Costa Rica was about 50 people. Now we're talking about thousands. We also see an interesting phenomenon, which is that the majority of people that are coming are coming from some of the most fragile states in the world. Mm -hmm. That includes Afghanistan, Sudan, etc. And third, about nearly one-tenth one are minors. So you have economic security issues, uh, risk. Um, so, so where do you see Costa Rica in that context? I, is it something that Costa Rica will continue to be just a bridge? Or is there going to be a new phenomenon of integration of extracontinentals? Well, that's, you know, I'm a, I'm a historian, so unfortunately I'm Would better like trying to, yes, I'm trying to, I, I'm better analyzing the past than uh, doing future <laughs> ex predictions. But nevertheless, um, I, we've been thinking about this. I mean, uh, Kevin Casas was now saying, and he's, he's completely right, that, uh, that this is here to stay. Uh, the phenomenon of migration is not going away. So we are preparing for this. I've, um, I've just instructed the Ministry of Planning and a number of institutions, um, including, uh, not, not including not only the, uh, the security uh, ministries or those in charge in security, because I don't want to criminalize migration, which is uh, something that could be very tempting to do especially because of the security ma ma uh, ma uh, Challenge. challenges that you've uh, just mentioned. It only takes one terrorist to go through, coming from a country, whatever, whatever country, that's to, and, and that's it. I mean, can you imagine? What it's, it's a s scenario that I don't want to think about. But uh, I've instructed these ministries to start preparing a, uh, a long-term program to deal with this issue uh, for the next few years. Uh, I'll be president only for a couple of more years, less than two years, but this is going to go on. So I would like the new government <coughs> to have the, the possibility to uh, count on this plan. Uh, at the same time, we are thinking of short-term uh, measures to be prepared to get uh, a significant numbers of, uh, of migrants all at once. We are getting around from 100 to 150 migrants a day in our border with Panama, and uh, probably 30 to 50 are leaving every day from the northern border into Nicaragua. So we have a, a huge group staying in Costa Rica at once. But if we were to get 500 of them a day, it would be impossible to handle and our agencies would collapse. So we are preparing for that. And uh, so we are now in, um, in search of places to uh, build shelters and also finding the resources to do this. We've, we've received some, some support from the United States, almost a million dollars, to install camps uh, or shelters, uh, tents, in the, in the northern part of the country where we could handle the new arrivals in better conditions than the ones we have now. Um, and obviously this is going to be uh, very, very important in order to deal this in a long-term perspective. Uh, Intermingling is going to ha it's going to happen, and that's that's quite all right. We all come from somewhere. Hmm? My great grandmother and my grandmother came from Jamaica in the early 20th century to Costa Rica. I'm not going to forsake migrations and say we're not going to tolerate migrants to come. That's baloney, and you all you, we all know it's not going to happen. They they get <coughs> through. You can put the most powerful army across the border, and they will come through. You also have the president of Cubans in the 1980s, the Marielitos. We have, we have lots of examples. It's happening in Europe. But having said that, we also have obligations with our own people. And we're going through tough times. So the, the feeling they have that we are somehow neglecting their rights is something that we have to take into account. And, and I, I'm not willing to uh, abandon that responsibility for which I was elected as well. So as we, we deal with this uh, migration issue, we have to be also thinking in you know, economic development. We have to think in other terms. L let me tell you an anecdote. I'm sorry I'm going to take more time answering your question, but this is, this is important. You know, when, we wh when we started getting the, what we thought were extracontinental uh, extra migrants, what we saw, what the reaction we saw on the people of Costa Rica was, uh, was quite interesting because they had accepted the Cubans quite well. But they looked like us, 
They almost eat the same things that we ate, they spoke the same language, and we knew for sure that they had a Christian background. You know, call it Santeria or call it whatever, but they were Christian. They had a Christian background. All of a sudden we have these people who look different, who, who didn't eat the same things, who didn't want their women to be touched by the police force, not even by other women. And so they were really, you know, pretty aggressive. So I, uh, I requested a friend of mine who is the imam of the only, of the only, uh, uh, of, of the Islamic community in Costa Rica, which, to go there. He doesn't speak any French, sp he speaks Arabic, he's, he's a Palestinian, and he went, he went there to talk with them. The minute they saw this guy and he said, Salam Alaikum, they calmed down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this was extraordinary. I mean, he could not stay there forever. We don't have too many people <coughs> who, who are Muslim in Costa Rica and who, deal to, who can deal with this situation. In fact, we've had been having problems with people translating, not to French, we have a lot of French yeah. speakers, but to Creole. It's not the same thing. It's, there's a situation there, you, it's not the same thing to speak with Cubans, even when we have an a, a funny accent, you know, and they don't. Um, but it's mucho más fácil. You know? mm -hmm. um, so all of these things are part of a culture of, of relationships, human relationship and otherwise, that will have to be taken care of. And for a small country like ours, four and a half million, we fit five times in New York City. Having a, the presence of thousands of foreigners all at once makes it very difficult to handle. I mean, at a given point, at the end of last year, there were more Cubans in La Cruz, the little town that's the last town before we get to Nicaragua, than Costa Ricans Wow! at that small town. Wow. And that says something of the, cha yeah. the long-term challenges that we have. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we'll continue to address questions of migration during the, the Q&A, but you mentioned um, in your opening remarks, you touched on the theme of the tax reform that's currently before Congress. Costa Rica has long, along with Uruguay, headed the list of human development indices in, in the region. The levels of health and, and, and education spending have always been high and very inclusive. And because I think it, in large measure because of that, Costa Rica has also scored so high on all these measures of, of democracy and, and uh, support for, for democratic governance. Um, and yet the country for the second year running has had a, a historic level of fiscal deficit according to the Costa Rican Central Bank. So there are um, a lot of people calling for uh, fiscal reform. Your government is trying to get there through Congress. What are some of the issues that are being discussed in the parliament and what aspects of tax reform do you see as the most viable given the division within the Congress among all of the distinct parties? Well, I must say in all frankness, uh, Cynthia, that we've had the last four administrations have tried to pass the fiscal reform, and uh, none had been able to, because of different reasons. You know, we have a, a fiscal car a fiscal a fiscal um, burden burden, burden of thirteen percent. Yeah. Compare it to twenty percent in Colombia, thirty-five percent in Brazil. I mean, it's almost it's so Central American yeah. that it just uh, staggers me because it's uh, it's too low. Now, uh, businessmen in, in Costa Rica say that it's not that, that that's not the number I should use because we have the social security uh, burden, but that's not the way to, to measure <laughs> the fiscal burden. So we have to be very careful about that. But the truth of the matter is that we're having the resistance of many sectors. I, and what I'm telling them is, listen, my administration is willing to pay e all what it takes to approve that, that fiscal reform. So, you know, Blame it on me. Uh, we're having elections in a year, uh, two years, and uh, we are willing to pay the, the price for this reform. But if we do not have the fiscal reform, Costa Rica's deficit is going to raise from 6% today to 8% by the end of my mandate. And the impact is going to be financial. Yes, it's going to be very serious, but it's going to be more serious, the impact that is going to have upon the credibility of the Costa Rican political class, which is what has you know a number of uh, agencias de, um, de riesgo, uh, the mm -hmm. risk analysis risk yeah. risk agencies, uh, agencies yeah. very uneasy. Yeah. I mean, is this government going to flunk again? Uh, we have been, and, and the big the big debate 
but I think it's an excuse, a bad excuse in many ways, is that we are asking for a fiscal reform without doing enough on the spending side. Right. And clearly, we've had a, 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 a welfare state since the 1950s that was very successful, and it's been also a very, uh, very big and expensive. and expensive, but democracy is expensive, you know, in general, in general. So a good democracy, not all expensive democracies are good, but all good democracies are expensive. <laughs> and I say that as the child of a shoemaker. It also happens with cho <laughs> shoes. Not all shoes, expensive shoes are good, good. but all good shoes are expensive. And uh, it's the same thing with democracy. And, and, and uh, we have a big state, and we've been trying to cut that state. But we have to be very careful, because if not, it's gonna, we're going to have disastrous effects. Um, let me give you an example. We are now... Uh, probably the second largest producer of medical supply um, uh, medical parts, services, uh, medical yeah. um, in, 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 in Latin America, devices in Latin America. And that's because of the capacity of our, of our workforce, the talent workforce that we have. That's the result of 150 years of consistent investments in public education. I'm not going to forsake that. Our Constitution mandates that as much as 8% of our GDP is invested in public education. And it's not going to be a teacher like myself, the president, that doesn't respect that mandate. I'm going to keep that even if the Congress doesn't approve the reform. Because I think that the consequences of not investing in education, or for that matter, in public health, would be disastrous for Costa Rica in the midterm and long term. Yeah. I mean, some of the problems we're having today with our educational system, which is not as good as it should be, and I grant you that, has to do with decisions that were made 20 years ago in the government of Miguel Angel Rodriguez, who cut investments in education. I'm not going to do that. But, but people in Congress say we're not doing enough with expenditures. And, uh, and I, I, I took two years, and I said this during my presidential campaign, I was going to take two years to be certain that we would do everything we could to cut uh, undue expenses in the government. And I think we've done that. We've risen uh, the, collection, the tax, tax, collect, uh, tax collection 10% last year. 15% is going to be this year. We've cut everything we can, or we could. And still, 95% of the government's expenditures are determined by law. So we only have 5% to deal with. And that, perc that percentage has been handled as much as, I, as, as, much as we could. So. The, the, the debate, this is why I say it's an excuse, because, uh, because sometimes what I hear uh, is not what I know is happening. There are lots of sectors that do not want to pay more taxes. Nobody wants to pay more taxes. Impuestos, they're called in Spanish. They're imposed on people. Okay? So, we, we don't, so I am conscientious of the, of, the, of the problem, but we have to have that reform. It's a question of giving viability to a country that's doing well in every other indicator, economic indicator at this point. I mean, the only flaw which we have, which is significant, we have two. One's the fiscal deficit, and the other one's employment, particularly for young people. But still within the, unemployment's still in the range which we've had for many decades, around 9%, you know. We've had any from 8 to 10%. When I came, became president, it was 10.1%. It's 9.2% at this point. But the fiscal reform is fundamental. And it's going to be fundamental also to deal with the migration issue and other issues, including fighting against organized crime, because the deficit we have in police officers and other things are, it's, it's increasing. Well, well the, you know, when you came to government, you, one of your agenda uh, election issues was corruption and infrastructure. W what would you say is your scorecard in that regard? Uh, corruption is uh, A. We haven't had any corruption cases so far. Toco Madera, wherever it is. Infrastructure. But infrastructure. Oh, it's going to be finished <laughs> by January. <laughs> it's on time. Uh, there's a symbolic bridge called uh, La Plata. It's so-called La Platina, popular. We, it's been. We've tried to. S it collapses three times a year. Uh, three times a year, and it's 60 meters long. So it's the ultimate proof of Costa Rica's incapacity to build anything. 
Okay, we're changing that. It's going to finish in, in, in January. It took two more years, but it's, it's going to be finished, we hope. But uh, no, I think the infrastructural problem is a problem. It, it's an accumulated problem. We have over 2,000 bridges that need to be intervened somehow. Uh, but uh, uh, on corruption so far, I'm very proud that my team has been very um, dedicated to preventing that. And in fact, Costa Rica is opening up as much as we can with, through the open government initiatives uh, so that uh, we reduce uh, corruption as, uh, as a uh, factor. Uh, on the issue of education, you say, I mean, I think you're right. It's not an issue of money. Sometimes it's in improving the quality. How, how is the government dealing with that? No, well, we, we, we are insisting with the uh, teachers' unions that we have to be more rigorous with, uh, with teachers. Um, they don't want to be examined, for example, in order to have their <coughs> contracts revalidated. As a professor, I think they ought to, but it's very difficult to, to convince them of this situation. We are also putting more uh, emphasis on technical education so that we will lessen the impact on the budgetary impact on universities, yeah. for example. But on the other hand, again, you know, if I have to pay a price for this, I would rather pay a price for exceeding our support of education and being called, as I have been called, and the government has been called um, irresponsable because of uh, funding un universities and, and, and the educational system than the opposite. You know, I think that, uh, but we have to b do better. Uh, I agree that uh, there are many things to be uh, uh, improved in, in, in education. Let me follow up on that. Um, Costa Rica is seen in, throughout the region as a model of many things, of, of uh, the quality of human capital because of the expenditures in education, um, of environmental preservation. Um, and you can speak more about this. Tom Lovejoy from the Smithsonian is somewhere here, and he can also um, address this. Um, what would it take for Costa Rica drawing on its human capital and the strength of, edu of its educational institutions to become also distinguished for its capacity for technological and scientific innovation, um, to convert itself not only as a hub for Central America, but also maybe as the Central American representative joining the other technological um, innovation hubs such as Medellin and Buenos Aires mm -hmm. and Guadalajara. What would it take for Costa Rica to do that? Well, first of all, we, we needed a policy. We now have a policy. We are dealing with um, academic centers of excellence in the United States and Europe, and uh, we are seeking for more, alli more alliances to this regard. I mean, Tom Lovejoy and, and Smithsonian were probably among the first ones to come, but there's also CATIE, the uh, agricultural center mm, that's uh, right. financed by the OAS uh, the in, in Turrialba that's been you know there for over a half a century. We have the Peace University. We have other centers of this nature. We would like to expand uh, on the uh, availab of the, um, in the um, association with uh, universities from the United States. We're already doing that. Uh, we have become another hub uh, yeah. that deals with, with innovation, uh, bringing uh, U.S. universities there. This is one way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is moving away from the old model of free zones devoted to textiles uh, into more sophisticated uh, areas, such as the ones we, we now have. We are, we are beginning to see investments coming to Costa Rica uh, in, in search of these other uh, opportunities. Oh, uh, for example, Intel is one good example of that. We used to manufacture Intel's uh, microprocessors uh, that were sold to China mainly. Um, well, now uh, Intel uh, took away part of that manufacturing facility to Vietnam, but they have brought into Costa Rica a concentrated labor laboratory to test the products before they reach the market. So that's an upgrading of these investments on free zones, which uh, has been very important for us because it entails more research and development of sorts. Now, we're still not in that, I mean, we're not Mumbai, we're not uh, Silicon Valley, or, you know, but I would like to see more of that happening, and that's a combination of investments and policy regarding this attraction of academic centers mm -hmm. into the country and, and labs, laboratories, uh, which are also very significant. This is particularly important in, in the medical and pharmaceutical industries. Mm -hmm. And we now have the laws that would allow for, uh, for example, for uh, testing 
uh, in, in Costa Rica, which is something that they really need. Mm -hmm. Last question, Manuel, just and then we'll open it up. Just one more question and we can. Um, what is Costa Rica strategy at SICA? SICA with an S, not with a zip. Yes, not the, not the, no. <laughs> <laughs> not SICA, the not SICA, but yeah, SICA. You can talk about that, but you know, the, the integration, the Central American Integration Secretary. Well, you know, to be enti entirely frank on this matter, you know, I always considered myself uh, to be one of the few Costa Rican integracionistas. Integracionista. You know, we, <laughs> we've been called all sorts of names regarding our commitments to Central America, including being the British of, of Central America because of our reluctance to admit our Central Americanity, our Central yeah. Americanity. Uh, and uh, I we, don't... We do have representatives of the Panamanian ambassador. Uh, oh, no, but that Panama, Panama, is well. part of, <laughs> Panama is part of Central America as much as it is uh, Belize. And for all practical purposes, the whole, I like to think of this as the enhanced Latin America, uh, Central American, the enhanced <laughs> Central American region, including the Caribbean. It makes a lot of sense to me uh, that the Dominican Republic is present and eventually Cuba and other countries because it's, we have to look at the bigger picture. I mean, it's, you know, in, and, and that brings us to a very interesting discussion of what the place would be for the Caribbean coasts of the United States, of so Mexico, Colombia, and Venezuela. And I think that the logic we operate in that sense with the Association of Caribbean States makes, makes a lot of sense. But I'm a little frustrated because we haven't been able to move forward with, with enough strength during the last couple of years. And I have to take that uh, also personally because of, of this commitment that I feel with, with the region. I was very upset, and this is the way I would like to, to mention it. I was very upset by what I thought was lack of solidarity of some of the Central American countries during the difficult uh, moments of our Cuban migration. I understand the reasons. I understood the reasons why some countries were reluctant to allow the Cubans to go through their borders when their own nationals were not being admitted to the United States. And the political pressures that it brought about on the, on the Central American regions are understandable. But we were in need, you know, and we felt that uh, we deserved, not as a country, but as a region, a more regional understanding of a regional problem. Okay? That didn't happen. So I. I decided that I was going to remove Costa Rica from the political instances of SICA until this issue uh, of uh, SICA reform was, uh, SICA is the Central American Integration System, uh, was, was addressed. And it took uh, the Honduran presidency pro tempore of the system <coughs> six months to put together something that resembles a bit the kind of reforms that I think the system needs. And it, it's not a question of institutions, it's a question of vision. What kind of Central America we need? And clearly, what we have today is not what we need. In, it, among other reasons, because this was a system that was created in 1991 before uh, everything else happened. Yeah. It was almost happened at the same time of the, of the end of the Cold War. And so we haven't touched the agreement ever since. And it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to, for this agreement to, to be opened up. And there are cer certain countries have said, you're not going to touch it. We're not going to allow you to, to change the basic treaty of the Central American integration country so, uh, system. But I still think that we need structural reforms. And next January, Costa Rica will preside over the SICA pro tempore. And I have vowed that we're going to take this and move ahead with this issue of, of SICA reform as it has been agreed to in the last meeting of the system in Honduras. So, you know, we're going to move ahead of this. But it's, it's, it's faltering. Um, you know, I hesitate to say this is only our problem. It's also happening in Europe. I mean, you, you can see that the integration notion is no longer v as strong as it was 10 years ago. But we need in Central American integration. It's, it's, it's the way to go. The world is moving towards larger blocks, geopolitical and, and trade blocks. Unless we are able to position Central America, it's going to be very difficult to deal with certain issues. And, and, and take one, climate change. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a huge one. And we need to think of climate change in regional terms because it's going to affect us regionally. I see Dr. Rumania here, and he's one of the leading 
scientists and experts in that field. You know, we need a regional approach. It's going to have, it's going to affect all our, our coasts. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, a problem to all our uh, water sources, for example, not only the dry corridor. So anymore. So, you know, th this is something that we have to do. Uh, I continue to be very much committed to this. Uh, Costa Rica is back participating fully in SICA. It's, we are under the Nicaraguan presidency, and I hope to receive from President Ortega the system in, at the end of the year, and I'll see how we can, we can push it forward. It's not going to be easy, and I'm not pretending that everything's going to be solved in six months under our, our leadership, but uh, I hope that we will provide the adequate conditions for all the members of the, of the system to feel free to, to think out of the box and, and maybe find ways to enhance SICA's influence in the region. Great. We'd like to open it now to you. Your questions, wow. Um, a lot of hands. We'll take uh, rounds of three. Please wait for the microphone and also let us know who you are by name and affiliation. Um, I'll start here, then we'll go all the way in the back and then to the sort of center middle right, right there, okay? Uh, my name is Roberto Penedo from Survivors of the War. Uh, welcome, Mr. President. Thank you. I have a question. When you mention that uh, Costa Rica will be part of a program with United States and the uh, North Triangle of Central America, does that mean that Costa Rica will be a part of the prosperity plan? Mm -hmm. No, sir. We'll, we'll take. We'll take oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Okay, let's go, go right all the way in the back here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just keep a note. Thank yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Silvia Yuso from El País newspaper. I was, uh, you've talked in the beginning about the, the, the privileges the Cuban migrants have when, uh, when, it mean, uh, when they come to the U.S. about these laws. And I understand that you wrote a letter in a, back in April to the U.S. president saying that they should uh, deal with the laws like the Ley Ajuste Cubana. I was wondering if this, uh, this came up in your conversations today with uh, Vice President Biden and President Obama. What they, what did, if they answered to your questions? What, what was the situation? And also in that conversation, if anyhow the situation in your neighbor, Nicaragua, where President Ortega is amassing some, a lot of power, if, that, if they had any question on that, if they were worried or if, you, if it came mm -hmm. out somehow. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. 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 And then we had this, there was a gentleman, uh, yes, this, this gentleman here. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome, President. Uh, yeah. I'm Guillermo Mendoza. I work for the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, so now we'll you talk about the Zika, <laughs> not Zika. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, when you refer to security, you 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 speak about drug trafficking, trafficking, uh, terrorism, violence, and uh, weapon uh, trafficking. Okay? Everything interrelated. No, uh, I wonder if uh, the issue of public health related to migrant is uh, one of the issues that your government is looking at, particularly uh, having migrants from uh, areas in which we know that uh, there have been cases of yellow fever, for instance, mm -hmm. and that uh, that disease is also transmitted for uh, by the same mosquito, the Aedes aegypti, <coughs> that we're dealing with uh, related to dengue fever, um, chikungunya, and daily Zika. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if uh, your administration is doing something to yes. prevent this type of... Yes, of course. Uh, on the question of Costa Rica being part of the As Alianza para la Prosperidad, no, we, will, we are not part of the, of the initiative. The government of the United States has been very clear about this. And actually that PTA program to uh, use Costa Rica as a bridge to uh, bring uh, refugees or potential refugees from the Northern Triangle to the United States is a Costa Rican uh, high refugee, uh, high um, commissioner. commissioner for the for refugees program that's financed by the United States but not uh, in which the United States is not a part of. So no, we are not, and the, f and the, and the resources that, uh, that are uh, going to be used, I understand, are not part of the uh, Northern Triangle resources. But uh, it's, it's not, Costa Rica is not joining the Northern Triangle as part of the uh, Alianza Prosperity Alliance. <coughs> uh, on the question of uh, 
of uh, the uh, laws in the United States. I mentioned the issue uh, during our convers the conversation with Pres President Biden, Vice President Biden, not with President Obama, but uh, clearly the uh, the laws that would require that would be required the changing in the laws that would be required in order to finish with this preferential policy towards Cuba would take uh, congressional congressional uh, action. And, um, and I understand this is not likely to happen in an electoral year. Um, so we, we didn't talk about that. There are other actions that would be presidential or executive in nature, nature that I think the United States would have to consider. But this is something that um, I have re very respect, respectfully submitted to, to the government of the United States. And uh, there's very little that I can do in order to, to, to uh, influence that at this point, particularly because of the context in which this situation has developed, not only because of the electoral context, but also because of the fact that the administration will soon uh, leave and a new administration will come. And this, I think, will have to be discussed in a, in a, in a, in a wider perspective. I mean, this entails uh, discussions not only in Washington, but with uh, different communities throughout the United States, including the Cuban uh, the American Cuban American community, so it's it's something that uh, we'd have to see in that to that regard. Yes, I mentioned uh, to the president and to uh, the vice president our concerns about uh, remilitarization in Nicaragua. We have uh, been on the record and publicly uh, mentioning uh, that we consider the 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 buyings of um, of war equipment, what we consider to be <coughs> war equipment in Nicaragua, something that concerns Costa Rica. Uh, I have said that I don't expect these resources to be used against Costa Rica. It's not likely, nor I think necessary, nor not I see any uh, hypothesis of conflict between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. But uh, we're not comfortable with, with rearmament. Uh, but that's a right that countries have, and I would like to say that we respect the decision of any country to, to deal with their armed services as they they think, but it's, it's not comfortable. And it's not comfortable either to see a government acquiring so much power as the government of Nicaragua is acquiring in the context of their coming, upcoming elections. But again, we are respectful of the, this is a, an opinion as any other, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the, the conditions of the Nicaraguan um, political, political regime. Uh, on public health. Yes, this is a very significant and important issue. I mentioned that the uh, Social Security Service of Costa Rica is taking care of, uh, and the Red Cross is taking care of the, of the different cases that we've seen. Fortunately, we have not identified anybody with yellow fever or even with, uh, with chikungunya. We're pretty much surprised. In fact, uh, the Panamanian government has um, indicated that they are um, mm, financing or they're vaccinating uh, some of the of the uh, migrants, but they get to Panama already after coming through the Darien uh, yeah. region, which is one of the regions that's particularly um, undergoing particular serious uh, conditions of chikungunya and, and, and dengue. Um, for us, the, uh, I mean, if, you d if, if a country doesn't deal with the public health issues that the migrants bring in, uh, very soon the migrants are going to be accused of everything they, br they bring uh, or they do not bring. Okay? So, and we don't want that. So we are taking care of, of this very, very carefully. We have identified, I've identified two cases of tuberculosis. Um, we have dealt with them. Again, the problem is that they go away very fast. <laughs> and so sometimes they disappear and we are not able to follow up these cases. But uh, it would entail long long contacts between individuals that have the disease in order to uh, pass it on to others. We have not seen that. Um, there are other health care issues that are complicated to deal with. Uh, sexual practices among migrants, some migrants. Uh, we have our Women's Institute looking into aggressions. We are concerned about rape and providing you know, enough security so as to uh, lessen um, the uh, risk of, 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 uh, of, of rapes and, and, and 
I hesitate to say domestic violence, but violence amongst <coughs> migration, mi migrants. Um, I don't know how you say asinados in, in English, but they are crowded, Fine. confined, and you know, a lot of people together, and that also brings in a lot of stress. So that this is also something that needs to be taken care of by psychologists. But again, it's a moving population, so this, this is very <coughs> difficult to handle. It's not with the Cubans, we had, you know, some of them were up to five months in Costa Rica, and so we, had to, we could provide recreational facilities for them, and they played uh, baseball and beat us up, and they played soccer, and we beat them up, <laughs> and you know, there were ways to handle this uh, from a ludic perspective, but, uh, but it's been difficult. But, but yes, the public health issue is central in, in the migrant uh, handling. Manuel, do you want to call on the next three? Take another round? Sure. Señalar. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yeah. The, the number three. The one in the middle. Yeah. Th thank you, President Solis, for being here. Um, as you were mentioning earlier, us Costa Ricans, we're, we're not angels, right? <laughs> Um, being a migrant here in, in the U.S. Uh, and as a Costa Rican, I've become painfully aware of many of the prejudices that us Costa Ricans have towards Nicaraguans, and you know that unfortunately that's that's part of our reality. Do you think that this historical moment of migration and unfortunately the the program that you just described, the UN program, has I think been very unfairly criticized by some of the local media? Is this a, an opportunity for us Costa Ricans to be educated in tolerance? and showing mi migrants compassion and solidarity? <coughs> Any other questions? Two more? Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to follow up with that. Wait for the mic, please. Thank you. It's coming right there. And then yeah. Hi, I'm Miriam Hassan, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank. I wanted to follow on that question and ask you more broadly about Nicaraguan migration to Costa Rica. Uh, if the flows keep coming, uh, how relevant it is right now, uh, migration uh, from Nicaragua. Uh, what is the relationship between Nicaragua and Costa Rica because of that migration? Uh, and if we see, as we saw, unaccompanied minors coming to the U.S., also coming from Nicaragua to Costa Rica, maybe also uh, from Nicaragua or from other countries of the region. Uh, and if you can talk more about this United Nations High Commission on Refugees thing, uh, rece reception of these 200 people per case. Thank you. Sure. Maybe one more. Yeah. Stephen Donahue from McClarty Associates. I'll give you an easy question. Where mm -hmm. is Costa Rica in its succession to the Pacific Alliance process? Uh, so there's a lot of talk about trade in the U.S. political system right now, and Costa Rica has some of its own <coughs> concerns about trade. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, you know, Costa Rica and Nicaragua relations are special. <laughs> Just like any bordering countries, we have our issues. We joke in Costa Rica saying that we don't have two seasons a year, the rainy and the dry season, but three. The rainy, the dry season, and the season with problems with Nicaragua. Okay? And I think it's the same thing with Nicaraguans. But we, we don't have the right to divorce ourselves. We came together into history. We will stay together for the rest of history. And as I see it, uh, discrepancies are not amongst people, but about, uh, mostly about governments. <coughs> yes, there are um, prejudices in, in, in Central America. Uh, uh, this is a two-way street. Uh, we have ours, they have theirs, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, we do not agree in the same perspectives. But I think that uh, in terms of the migration flows, the Costa Rican population has been extremely generous. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguans living in Costa Rica, and even with those <laughs> prejudices, they continue to be, you know, absolutely essential to our economy and to our house household management. I mean, so much so that we have, I don't know how many thousands of Nicaraguan women raising our children, and this has been the case for years and years in the past. 30% so of the female labor force. 30%. Okay. So there you go. I mean... Talking about uh, prejudices when you have these women taking care of, their chi of your children in your house is something to, to think about. But you're right, there are prejudices. And 
we have all to, to deal with them. You know, it's interesting if you, if you see the statistics, um, we, we have not had true serious conflicts with the Nicaraguan population through the years. Uh, some countries have, uh, some governments have attempted to uh, start massive deportations and that didn't work out. Yeah. Probably because the uh, wives and children of the decision makers or their husbands would say, listen, don't go there because if what's going to happen with our, again, with, with, with crops, what's going to happen with buildings, what's going to happen, I mean, they are very important. Costa Rica and Nicaragua have a mutual relationship which is extraordinarily important. Nicaragua is our third or fourth trade partner, over $700 million a year. And, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua is receiving from Costa Rica millions of dollars in remittances. I don't know what the number is. He, Manuel is the family expert on this issue. But, um, but we, we need each other. And even if we didn't, we're there tied together by these bounds of transborder uh, associations. So I think that there is a, an awareness of this. And Again, you know, when I, I gave this uh, visions of what happened with the Cuban migrations, once again the population of, of the northern part of Costa Rica was exceedingly generous in receiving them in their homes, in, in their uh, communal um, buildings. Uh, and by and large, even with the new waves of migration, the Costa Rican population has been resistance, resistant more than what with the Cuban population, but nevertheless they have agreed and we haven't had expressions of hate, race hate or whatever, uh, with, with, the, with the Haitian population. But they're tired, I, I, and I think it's very human. Uh, they, they, they have endured a challenge they were not used to. I mean, this is something that has not happened in the country ever. The, the, the continuous passing of, of people who behave differently from what we're used to. Um, you know, talking about public health, uh, the, the I was <laughs> told the other day that by the um, president of the, of the Costa Rican Social Security Institute, this is an interesting anecdote, we had an African lady who gave birth to an African Costa Rican citizen the other day, and she was breastfeeding the child in the women's uh, ward of the hospital, and she was, you know, she took off all her clothing and she was breastfeeding naked. And all the other ladies were scandalized, looking at this woman breastfeeding. I think it's beautiful, but <laughs> we're not used to this. Costa Rican women are more uh, private in the way they do this. And they were very uncomfortable with this. So we have to get used to these things. It's, it's not easy. It's a cultural change. And, uh, and the numbers are very large. So when you have people moving around, some of them doing their physical needs in public, and, uh, as they probably do in their own countries, is something that people do not appreciate. So compassion, yes, understanding, yes, but it, take ta it takes time, it takes an effort in schools. And since we don't have the possibility of integrating anybody because they're moving on all the time, uh, the process is, is going to be challenging, at, at least challenging, and, and we're trying to do that. In terms of Nicaraguan flow, the flows continue. Uh, there, this is historical. We, we go back and forth. Uh, we, we, the Nicaraguan workers uh, work on our orange uh, uh, plantations. They work on um, uh, coffee, sugarcane plantations. They work in our constructions. Uh, they do things that Costa Ricans don't like to do anymore. Uh, many of them were working in Panama during the enhancement of the Panama Canal. That is finished, so in no likelihood they're going to come back into Costa Rica. The Costa Rican economy is growing, 4.2% uh, a year, GDP. Uh, this is twice as much as the, re uh, the average of the Latin American growth, uh, which is very good. But uh, so in all likelihood, we will see you know, more needs of, uh, for, for, for labor. And it's probably probable that we will see some of them being Nicaraguan. Um, and and I, I think that um, we we benefit from, from that relationship. Uh, sometimes we are more critical of it than what we should. I mean, people in Costa Rica talk about a million Nicaraguans in the country. We know that that's not true. 350, 400,000 is the right number. We talk about Nicaraguans being involved in international crime. That's not true either. Uh, less than 1% are Nicaraguan. Most of, uh, of our 
prisons are, are for Costa Ricans. But uh, it, is, it is true that, uh, that there is a certain tension in there. Uh, unaccompanied children, um, we don't have that problem uh, inward unless what I mentioned about children being brought in by, uh, by these migrants of the new, or the ex what we call extracontinental, which uh, again uh, are basically Haitian. The program, the PTA with the United States, doesn't deal with unaccompanied children. We are talking about families at best uh, that will bring their children with them and whose children will be certified uh, children of the family they claim to be of. So we are going to get them, but they're not, we're not, we don't have a, a problem with unaccompanied children. <coughs> As a matter of policy, I have voiced my concern about unaccompanied children in, at the United Nations during the last two general assemblies, and I have criticized that very, very much. I find it extremely perverse to be in a situation where children are forced out of their country because the conditions in which they live in that country of origin are so bad that their parents have the illusion that they, can, they should risk them uh, in a process such as the one we see and send them to another country. I mean, I find that to be unacceptable. Um, and, and excuse my frankness, but I, I have to be candid about this. It's unacceptable. I, I find that, that to be extremely troubling troubling for all of us as a, as, a, as a community, as a human community, uh, but not, uh, not because we're suffering of that problem. And the Pacific Alliance, um, you know, we have been, I was, uh, I was in, in, in Chile for the last meeting with President Macri. Um, I have said that Costa Rica cannot, um, cannot ignore the fact that with the kind of economy we have, which is highly open, it's one of the most open countries in, in the world for, for, world, for, uh, for trade. We, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that uh, the Pacific Alliance is very, very important for that sector of the economy. Almost 90,000 90, direct jobs are provided by uh, foreign direct investments in the country. But we also have to be to realize, and this is something that previous governments did not acknowledge, that there is another part of the economy that legitimately feels that, uh, that, that free trade agreements uh, have hurt them very, very much, and, and, and they have. And we have been saying for over 15 years now that somehow we are going to neutralize that effect, and we have not. And so when the Pacific Alliance comes and we have free trade agreements with all the members <coughs> of the Pacific Alliance, what they tell us is, listen, just keep the same conditions as in the free trade agreements and we will agree, because it's, it's already there. We have to remember that we have already members of the uh, free trade uh, of the um, Na uh, CAFTA, DR. So most of the effects are already there, are going to happen nev regardless if we, in, you know, to in negative effects are going to happen anyway. But they, they are very much resisting this. What I've said is that, listen, if we do not have, and I'm not conditioning it, but if we do not approve the fiscal plan, it is going to be impossible for the country either to uh, use the benefits of the, free tr of the uh, Pacific Alliance or, and or uh, neutralize its negative effects. So until I can see, and I have the certainty, that we will have an economy that can withstand the pressures of a globalized world that requires that fiscal reform. I'm not going to get into it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm be, I've been very frank. I've, I've told this to the presidents of the Pacific Alliance. I said this to the state of, in my State of the Union address last May. I continue to be on the record uh, on this issue. I will have a meeting with the uh, sectors that feel that are going to be affected by this on Thursday of this week, in three days. They're very aggressive. And what I'm telling this, listen, I'm, I want a win-win ag agreement on Pacific Alliance, and I think we can get one. But the condition for this requires a national understanding of what we're talking about. And the first thing I, I want to, to see is that discussion to be opened up. Maybe this is in my academic vein here. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want 
for us to withstand the kinds of divisions, national divisions, we suffered with the CAFTA DR. So we're going to put it all on the table. And I want this to be discussed openly. I want everybody to partake of this. I don't want the government taking sides on this as of yet. The official position is we're not going to do this or that until we have the fiscal plan but in the meantime, approved, but in the meantime, let's talk about it. And let's do it deeply and let's do it seriously and not without, uh, without these uh, positions of you know, extremes that, that we had in the past. Sure. President Solis, uh, yeah. Ambassador Makaya, do we have to, uh, time for one last yes, round? We're a little bit out of time. We'll take one, one last round. Um, we are uh, blessed, I guess, to have an overflow room given the interest in this event. So I think in all fairness, I'm gonna take uh, two questions from the overflow where I can't see people's hands. I think both are related to foreign policy questions that are um, very important as we discuss globalization and Costa Rica's role in the world. One question has to do with Costa Rica's new and expanding relationship with China. Um, what type of Chinese investments have been given priority uh, by your administration? Another picks up on a point that you raised in your talk and in your response to the questions, which is the expected impact of the Colombian peace accord on Costa Rica specifically, what do you expect in terms of what you have alluded to being an increase in narco-trafficking? Um, and I will take one more from here. I see someone very, yes, all the way in the back. Yes, all the way in the back. Please wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. I'm Julia Edwards, a journalist with Reuters. Uh, you mentioned the recent announcement about Costa Rica taking in about 200 refugee seekers from the Northern Triangle, I think starting in September. When that was announced from the U.S. side in January, there were plans to see as many as uh, tens of thousands of migrants come in through a similar program. Um, did the U.S. ask Costa Rica to see more refugees through their country, and um, why agree only to 200? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. Um, China. Yeah, Costa Rica's uh, relationship with the Popular Republic of China was established in 2009. It was one of the most important achievements in the foreign policy of uh, Mr. Oscar, uh, Dr. Arias, uh, President Arias' uh, government. We had uh, relations uh, with Taiwan up until then, which is the case of all the other countries of Central America at this time. Uh, so obviously, some countries like Panama has a very, have a very strong relationship with the uh, people Re People's Republic of China's government, but the official relationship remains with, with Taiwan. Uh, most of the investments have been in, um, in trade. I mean, we've continued to see the, the trade relationship to grow on uh, benefiting China, of course. Uh, we have a very, um, there, there has been um, investments in infrastructure, uh, one of the most important roads that will be <coughs> built in the next five years, I hope less than that, but in the next five years is the road that connects um, central the Cote San Jose with, with the Caribbean port of Moing, where the uh, Dutch company APM is building a huge um, container terminal, which is, has been a very important one. So the Chinese are building that, and they would like to see more investment. I say they because we are in the process of opening up new concessions, and, and Chinese investors are going to participate in that, in infrastructure, transportation, and energy issues. Um, on the impact of the Colombian peace agreements, you know, I hope that uh, what we are seeing in terms of the increase um, activities of of, uh, of narco. Uh, organizations uh, is not related to, to, the to the changing conditions in Colombia. But we hear that this is probably one variable that could be uh, generating the fragmentation of historical cartels and the, uh, re the enhanced activity of these in the region. Relocation. Uh, and relocation of some of these cartels. So we are looking into it very carefully uh, and we have our intelligence agency uh, dealing with it in a regional fashion. So we, we think that we have to work, and we work very closely with the Colombian authorities. Uh, we are grateful with their support and their counseling because of the ex specialty uh, with the Panamanian government. And uh, we now have the 
capacities enhanced to, to deal with that. We've received a number of you know, radars and, and patrol boats, cutters. Uh, we have new uh, aircraft uh, to, to deal with this. So we, we hope that we will be able to deal with it. But uh, clearly, so far, we've seen a relationship there that's troubling. Uh, this is how I would qualify it. Now, on the PTA, um, no, the United States did not ask for more than 200. It was part of the, uh, the number came with the, the, the proposal that we got. Uh, six months at the most, 200 tops uh, every six months. I, um, I think that it was a, a very good uh, number for us to handle. Uh, we, we, could, we can deal with 200 individuals. Um, clearly, the conditions of our PTA is pro are probably different than the ones that the United States has, el has elsewhere in Europe and, and other places. But uh, as President Obama told me, this is a signal of the way in which the United States would like to see the way in which uh, some of these issues are handled. Orderly, in an orderly fashion, uh, in a secure manner, uh, so that we are at least 100 percent, I'm not, I'm not going to say 100 percent, but in a very good proportion, certain that the people that seek asylum are uh, legitimate asylum seekers. Um, and I feel very comfortable with this because I, th I think that in those numbers we can handle the, 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 the incoming uh, potential refugees um, in blend them into the community, uh, have them live with Costa Rican families, have their children receive English classes or whatever language uh, the, the country where they will be relocated will be. Uh, and this is probably going to be an added value uh, capacity that they will get uh, in, in th via the program. So I think it's a, it's a t program completely consistent with our uh, humanitarian tradition traditions and, uh, and also a very positive one, both for the migrants as well as f for the other countries. Uh, and I continue to say that we need to show our solidarity with the Northern Triangle. This is one way in which we can show that solidarity. Right. President Solis, you've been extraordinarily generous with your oh, time. Thank you, thank thank you, you for your much. frank uh, um, insights. Manuel, thank, thank you for the collaboration. Thank you all for attending on a hot uh, August afternoon, actually, where the temperatures are falling a little bit. Um, Ambassador Makaya, all of your staff with you uh, from Costa Rica, we're delighted. Please join me in a round of applause to thank President Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.